Xenoblade Chronicles 2 somehow manages to have both the lowest and highest amount of playable characters from all the games in the series. This depends on whether or not you take the many different blades into account. Some people aren't the biggest fan of the blades, but I personally really like their addition. They give the gameplay way more depth, and a large amount of them makes it so that the player has a lot of room to experiment. You know, if you're actually able to get them. I've wanted to make this video for a very long time, but couldn't because I didn't have all the blades. But since I recently got every last one of them, I don't think there's a better time than now. So, the rules for this video. Any blade from the story, side quests, the gacha system or the challenge mode can be on this list. However, I'm not looking at Torna the Golden Country as the battle system there is a bit too different. And just to be clear, this is not a tier list. My top 10 is based on how much I like using these characters and how much I like them personality wise. As a final heads up, there will be spoilers. If you haven't beaten the game yet, you should not watch any more of this video. With all that said, here are my 10 favorite blades in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Hey, remember what I said about this not being a tier list? Yeah, if you didn't believe me then, you definitely will after seeing this. In case you guys don't know, Godfrey might be one of the worst blades in the entire game. He's a shield hammer for starters, which is a terrible weapon type. He's an ice element, which might be the worst element. And two of his battle skills actively work against each other. He clearly doesn't have a lot going for him. But on my first playthrough, he was one of the few blades I had on Morak. Ever since I got him around chapter 5, he was a main part of my team. With Godfrey, Bridget and Aegeon, my Morak now has access to 3 different elements and 3 parts of the driver combo. I stuck with this team for the majority of the game, so obviously I grew pretty attached to Godfrey. Yes, he is cheesy and hard to take seriously, and probably has the dumbest blade quest in the entire game, it's like they were trying to make him the butt of all jokes, but honestly, all of that just makes me like him even more. He has just become such an infamously bad blade, and I can't help but laugh at some of the jokes people crack about him. But despite his reputation, he was actually pretty good at tanking from what I remember. Though his damage output was, in fact, terrible. Yeah, good luck keeping the aggro when your attacks do zero damage. That's actually why I ended up overdrive protocoling him over to Zeke. That way I can increase his defenses in case my tank dies or if the enemies suddenly target him. Besides, if you switch to Godfrey, you probably won't keep the aggro for long anyway. Do I still use him nowadays? Fuck no! I don't think I've touched him since I started New Game Plus. Still, I like him and used him for the majority of my playthrough. It would have felt wrong if I didn't put him on the list. So there's this small YouTuber who played this game on his channel recently. Maybe some of you have heard of him before, Chaga Conroy? Yeah, he's pretty great. He says his goals with his let's plays are to get his viewers to play the game alongside him and to show them parts of the games they didn't even know they liked. And in my case, he succeeded in both aspects. Thanks to his let's play, I finally resumed my new game plus playthrough and thanks to that, I got addicted to challenge mode for a little while. And wouldn't you know it, I even found a new favorite play to use. Oh, they brought back uncontrollable! This is amazing, guys! I'm happy for any representation Zillobit X can get because I swear it always ends up getting the short end of the stick somehow. In Smash, the only Xenoblade game with no character, stage or even music. In real life, stuck on the Wii U with no remake or sequel in sight. And in Xenoblade 2? Well, we got Elma, but it's pretty clearly a last minute addition. They didn't even record the drivers calling out her name when you switch to her. That's just sad, man. Well, on the bright side, it seems the balancing team also ignores her, as she's one of the most broken blades in the game. Elma brings along the overdrive system from X, which was by far my favorite part of the combat in that game. If you activate overdrive in this game, your whole party gauge gets used up and you can't use chain attacks as long as it is active. In return though, you absolutely wreck everything. More damage, faster arch recharge, and enemies have lower resistances to statuses like break. This has 
carried me through so many challenge battles as I could keep enemies locked in driver combos and unleash havoc upon them. Overdrive is literally the one reason I bring Alma along. Usually I just switch to her, activate it, maybe use a blade combo or evasion art and then go back to my other blades. I know she's really strong. But she's also really behind on her affinity chart, and I was not about to do all those challenges again. But hey, Alma is amazing, and this might be the only way I'll get to use her or Overdrive on the Switch, so I'll happily take it. Alright, those of you who've only used Blades from the main story can finally follow along again, because number 8 is the jewel of Moradain, Bridget. I think now is a good time to show what my party looked like for most of the game. Ever since chapter 5, my party consisted out of Rex, Zeke and Morak. I pretty much alternated between Rex and Zeke for my lead, but I could always count on Morak and her right hand to hold the aggro and dodge everything. Bridget is one of the best evasion tank blades in the game, even with all the power creep DLC blades. She has a good focus on both agility and damage output, as two of her battle skills buff her agility, while another skill increases her damage every time she evades an attack. As if that wasn't enough, she also gives Morak a break art and an art that gives her guaranteed evasion for a few seconds. You know, because she really needed that. Bridget is also the first story blade on this list, and because of that, she obviously gets more time in the spotlight compared to most of the gacha blades. She isn't one of my favorite characters per se, but she had her fair share of good moments. Her relationship with Pyra was pulled off really well, and it all pays off in Chapter 7 with the famous Rex laugh. Seriously though, it's all around a great scene, and Bridget's voice actress just killed it here. Outside of that though, she just doesn't really do much for me. Her big character moment was supposed to be in Morifa, where she gets to ask Jin about her past self. I just think it's a bit weird that she values his opinion so much when Mithra's right there? It just falls a bit flat for me when you realize that Mithra should know just as much as Jin. Still, Bridget is a fine character and a fantastic blade. She has certainly proven her worth. So, now you guys know my main party, and some people might think, hey, if you didn't have Nia on your team, who did you use as your healer then? Answer, uh, no one, I just kind of died a lot in the early game. Yeah, I don't know why, but I just never use healers on my first Xenoblade playthroughs. In Xenoblade 1, I benched Charla as soon as I got the stoic and inscrutable Duncan, and in 2, I don't think I've ever used Nia, or Tora for that matter, in any serious fights after chapter 5. Or, well, to be more specific, I didn't use Driver Nia. I know Nia is commonly regarded as the worst driver, but even before I knew that, having one party member solely dedicated to healing just never really appealed to me. I also just didn't get any good blades on her for a long time, so that didn't help either. However, if you're like me and relied on Pyra and Mifra a lot, you also had a huge Aegis-shaped hole in your party around Chapter 7. Blade Nia came at just the right time for me and complemented my overall playstyle really well. I don't like lowering my overall attack power just to have someone on a healing blade 24-7. So in comes Nia, who is literally just a big heal button. If someone is low on HP, I'd switch to her, use redemption once and then move on with my life. Okay, to be fair, she has much more to offer. She doesn't do much damage, but in return she specialized in every form of healing imaginable. Passive HP regeneration, HP potions, specials that heal, debuff cancelling, you name it. I'm actually glad I turned out to like Blatnia this much. I never felt like using her as a driver, but I always thought she was an interesting character. Her being a flesh eater would have been a nice plot twist for me, if I didn't get spoiled on it. Yeah, okay, I want to vent about this. So, I looked up how to change the drivers of your blade swords. I clicked on a random tutorial video and it literally started with Blade Nia clearly in sight. Sick dude! Fucking awesome! Anyway, uh, yeah, Nia is great. Some people might prefer her as a driver, but personally, she was the only healer blade I ever needed. She might only be number 7, but I still love her. I love her and all these guys!
I'm actually not too big of a fan of most DLC blades, which might sound a bit weird considering that they're, for the most part, really good. Like with Alma, I got most of them pretty late and didn't feel like getting them up to speed with the other blades I already had. However, there's someone I just had to include in my main group somehow. It's so cool that they brought back three guest characters from the previous games. And what's even better is that two of them are some of the best blades in the game, while the other is Shulk. Yeah, let's get into that. All the DLC blades are reskins of pre-existing weapon types with some minor changes. Elma and Fiora are reskins of the twin rings, while Shulk with his Monado is a reskin of... the Shield Hammer. Okay, so this might be the worst weapon class, but thanks to some sped up animations and the usual DLC privileges, Shulk is... an actually competent attacker. For real though, he actually has the highest auto attack stat in the entire game and is able to use Monado Purge, Cyclone and Buster to inflict some decent damage with his specials. He can also use Monado Enchant and Speed to buff the power, accuracy and evasion of the entire party by a good 40%. This is all decent, but it doesn't really compare to Elma's Overdrive or Fiora just being broken. But Shulk still has one more trick up his sleeve. He can see the future, remember? Just like in Xenoblade 1, you'll get visions for fatal attacks. Though this time completing a button challenge is enough to negate all damage. Another good thing about Shulk and the other guest characters is that you can freely switch them around between drivers without needing an Overdrive protocol. Morag is decent with shield hammers as they give her a topple art and better defenses. However, I also like him on Zeke, mostly for the same reasons as with Godfrey. Whenever I was in a bind, I could just switch to Shulk for more survivability and access to visions. This is mostly what I use Shulk for. He's a great tank that can actually dish out damage while also supporting his allies. Sure, if you're looking for brute strength, then the girls are definitely better, but Shulk has just been of more use to me personally. Also, he and Zeke both say I'm really feeling it, and that's amazing. I'm really, really feeling, feeling it. I feel like everyone has this one blade that just took them forever to get. It's so painful to know that you only need one more blade that just refuses to come home. For most people, this is Cosmos, the blade with the all-time lowest probability to get pulled. I'm one of these people. So, fun story, on my original playthrough I said, okay, I got every blade aside from Cosmos, so I'll only start New Game Plus when I get her. I spent around 10 hours to collect over 500 core crystals and didn't get her. Eventually, I just gave up and started New Game Plus anyway. Thankfully, I learned about some better strategies, and while it still took some time, I did eventually get her. I didn't think she'd fit into my party at the time, but I spent like... Two years trying to get her, I'd better get some use out of her. I quickly learned that there was a reason Cosmos is this rare. She used to be one of the best blades in the game, and while the DLC blades and challenges might have stepped up their game, Cosmos is still able to keep up. Her battle skills are great, one gives you more damage as well as more defense, and another increases the damage of her specials. And those specials are also amazing. Her level 1 is fast and great for chain attacks, while her level 2 will hit every enemy on the field while also healing the entire party. Yeah, Cosmos is ridiculous and I've been using her non-stop ever since I got her. She's admittedly not that interesting of a character for me and I probably spent the least amount of time with her out of anyone on this list, but she more than makes up for that with how incredibly useful she's been for me. Her level 2 special in particular really helped me get through some of the harder challenge battles. It might have taken me forever to get her, but I'd say the wait was... almost worth it. A few entries ago, I talked about the reason I started using Nia. So, let's move on to the reason I started using Tora. Poppy Cutie Pie. Look, nothing against Tora, but after I got Morag, I literally had no reason to use him anymore. I mean, they give him a mediocre fire-type evasion blade, and literally one story battle after that, Bridget, the very best fire-type evasion blade, joins your party. Great game design. 
I just didn't like the playstyle of Poppy Alpha or QT. And Morag just had access to more blades that don't require you to play Tiger Tiger, so the choice was pretty clear for me. After I finally unlocked QT Pie though, she was just loads of fun to play around with. Something that makes her unique is that she's the only blade in the game with both a break as well as a launch art. That break art in particular might also just be the single best art in the game. Driver combos are some of the best tools at your disposal, but as a balancing factor, most late game enemies have a higher resistance to break. This is not a problem with Cutie Pie however, since her break art hits 3 times and all those 3 hits have a chance to break its target. Combine this with the right accessories and as long as your opponent is not completely immune, Tora will be able to break through any resistances. And then New Game Plus came around and let you trade in experience for Poppy parts because fuck Tiger Tiger. With this, you can easily make Poppy any element, give her specials any bonus effects, and just give Cutie Pie in particular a bunch of extra aux scores because why not? Yeah, this Poppy form is just broken. She's seen as one of the best plays in the game for a good reason. Like with Nia, Poppy was a character I liked but never used much, so I'm happy this form did her justice. It's also a really nice touch how Cutie Pie's design and weapon might have been influenced by Pyra and Mifra. And I'll just use this part to talk about Poppy's overall character, since I really like how she grows to become more and more human as the game progresses. Something I don't see many people bring up is that her voice actually comes to sound less and less robotic as the game goes on. What will we find? Poppy failed her mission. What will we find? Poppy failed her mission. I started to get really tired of her monotone robot voice, so that's probably why this change took out to me so much. There's just one downside to Cutie Pie. You have to use Tora. It just kind of sucks that I can't stick with my preferred party. But honestly, Bobby is worth it. Again, she single-handedly made me want to use Tora, and the fact that the driver she's on is the worst thing I have to say about her should speak for itself. And now, let's talk about my waifu. <laughs> Sorry, I meant Husbando. Okay, I usually start by talking about how good the blades are in battle, but really, I mostly like Wolfric for who he is. The biggest scary guy with a heart of gold is a character archetype that I've seen many times before. I know it's not at all unique, and hell, it's not even unique in this game, but they still always end up becoming some of my favorites. Wolfric especially is just way too wholesome. His heart to heart and blade quest are just about him wanting to make friends and helping people, and his favorite pouch items are books and board games, ah, it's so adorable! I also like how you encounter him as an enemy first, as it explains a lot about his whole appearance and personality. He looks a bit like a monster, since, you know, his driver kinda was a monster too, but he's also really kind hearted and looks out for others, like a parent or elder would. It's a bit subtle, but it's a great example of how a driver's nature can shape the blades they awaken. Okay, I see, this is like with Godfrey. You like a blade for his personality, even though he's not that good. Uh, yeah, that's the great part about Wolfric. He's actually as strong as he looks. Especially for a blade that was in the game since it came out, his battle skills are ridiculously good. An easy to reach damage increase, increased critical damage, and extra damage when enemies are either toppled or launched. To make it even better, they gave this guy to us for free. Every player is guaranteed to get him. Wolfric even plays a big part in speedruns of Xenoblade 2 because of how easily he can blow up his opponents with his specials. Clearly, I'm not the only Wolfric fan here. Even Rex's AI seems to really like him, as he tends to switch to him a bit too much for my liking. Maybe it's because he has a break or aggro down art, but whatever the reason, this does make me a bit hesitant to bring him along in some fights. When I'm in control of Rex though, I always have my monster boy with me. Oh man, I remember when this was considered a bad blade. I always loved Pandoria. After all, she's the blade of Zeke, which makes her awesome by default. Not everyone seemed to share this sentiment though, as the art she gives to Zeke are some of the slowest in the entire game, taking forever to start up and finish. Not helping with this is the fact that one of her battle skills is 
essentially wasted, as it's dedicated to making her auto attack slightly faster. But hey, as Zeke would put it, Even the darkest night is followed by a dawn. That dawn being New Game Plus in this case. Zeke now has the option to unleash his Eye of Shining Justice, and this single-handedly made Pandoria 100 times better. When Zeke decides to use more than 5% of his true power, all of his arts are powered up and sped up. This temporarily gives him the highest damage output out of anyone in the entire game. All of this is great, but truth be told, I like to play as Pandoria long before this. For a long time, she was the only character I had with a launch art, and overall, her electric element has great synergy with the rest of my party. It also might have helped that I just really liked Zeke, but didn't have any other plates for him. Seriously though, I did have to stop myself and wonder whether or not I put her this high solely because I associate her with her driver. Not helping with this decision was her lack of story relevance. Pandoria is just someone I wish got more time to shine. Aside from summoning Genbu, she didn't really have any big moments in the story up until chapter 7. It did get made up for in the Spirit's Crucible, where Zeke finally opens up about their backstory, which causes Pandoria to open up more and finally reveal her eyes. This is pretty neat, don't get me wrong, but I just wish we got to see more of her. Pandoria doesn't do anything else in the story after this, and she also barely interacts with anyone in the party aside from Zeke. Eh, it seems like she can be a bit socially awkward at times, and I do like her relationship with Lord Thunderbolt, so I'll give her a pass. Pandoria actually used to be my number one shortly after I beat the game, and that was before the New Game Plus buff. But over the years, there's just one character that grew on me even more. I'm sure most of you will know who's next, so let's stop stalling and move on to the honorable mentions. Veil! I already had a spear user with Wolfric and a dark type element with Elma, but after watching Chaga's Let's Play, I grew to love her personality. Adenine. One of the few blades I got on Nia. I like her well enough and the launch art she gives Nia is fucking awesome, but like I said, I barely use Driver Nia. Aegeon. I used him for a long time, but he's just too focused on agility. Like Godfrey, his attacks just don't do enough damage to hold the aggro. Also, his personality is non-existent. Dagas! Overpowered Blade that I kind of like, but he just messes up most of the synergy I have with any of my teams. Fiora! Pretty much outclasses Nia as a healer in every way while dealing insane damage. She did get me through some tough battles recently, and I think she would fit well in my party if I used her more, so consider her the unofficial number 11. And now, let's move on to the actual number 1. And the award for the most unique choice for the number one goes... Not to me, because I put Pyra and Mifra here! Now, just to be clear, yes, I'm counting these girls as one. You can switch between them at any time, and they only take up one slot on the selection screen anyways. If the game treats them as one blade, then so will I. Though, if you really want me to choose, I'd go with Mifra, because she specifically has my all-time favorite playstyle in this game. This is mostly because of her skill, Lightspeed Flurry, which will recharge the last art she used if she got a critical hit during it. This lets you cancel art into art into art into art, and it's just the most satisfying thing ever. And while I didn't realize this on my first playthrough, Mifra was the glue that kept my party together. Her foresight increases evasion, which helped Bridget to tank, her light element had great synergy with fire and electric elements, and after I got rid of Godfrey, Anchor Shot was both my main topple art as well as a somewhat reliable form of healing. While some people might say Pyra becomes obsolete when Mifra gets introduced, I'd say she can still be useful as her specials get a big damage increase during blade combos. Personally, I use Mifra for most of the fight, but switch to Pyra for one or two imported combos. Just like in Smash! And then there's Numa for even more coverage between the elements. Though funnily enough, in terms of damage output, the true form can get outclassed by both Pyra and Mifra in the post game. Long story short, Blades get stronger if you build trust with them, but that doesn't carry over with the true form sadly. But it's still nice to have the coverage. Character wise, there are even more things to love about the Aegis girls. But this video is already long enough as is, so let's keep it short. So yeah, I like Mifra more. I love her sass and sarcasm, though Pyra is a really endearing character as well. 
They both have so many great interactions with the rest of the cast. Their development over the course of the main story is amazing, and after beating Torna, I started to feel even more for these characters. But honestly, it's some of the little things that make me love these characters even more. I love how Mifra cries at happy endings just like Adam used to, or how Pyra takes a quote out of Van Damme's book when you complete her affinity charts. Power depends on the heart of its wielder, right? It might be the cliche pick, but there really isn't any blade I like the playstyle or personality more of. I really can't put anyone other than Pyra and Mifra on the number one spot.